most important thing about exercise, it's probably the most effective way of actually slowing the aging process because it actually has a whole wide ranging effects um, in terms of both muscle health, bone health, and obviously heart lung health. Okay, so now there's, there's aerobic exercise and there's anaerobic exercise. Maybe yeah. we should start with a bit of exercise 101. Okay. What's, what's the difference and how do they impact aging? Okay, aerobic exercise is generally continuous exercise for a long period of time. Things like walking, jogging, cycling. So that's cardio. Cardio what work. People refer to as cardio. Yep, cardio work. Yep. yep. Um, whereas anaerobic exercise is more short term, powerful, explosive work, which might only last for anything from 10 seconds through to two or three minutes. Okay, so that's weight training? Weight training, or, and what, sprinting. Resistance? resistance? Yes. So what's resistance the difference training? between weights and resistance? I think people get a bit confused <coughs> about training. Okay. Um, well, weights is a way of achieving resistance exercise. Oh, okay. um, you can obviously do resistance exercise by using uh, what we call therabands, which are like large rubber bands. We can use springs, we can use uh, some Pilates equipment. Um, we can do, do anything that resists, makes the muscles resist the force that the actual equipment is supply, applying. All right, so when it comes to um, cardio exercise or aerobic exercise, what are the specific benefits when it comes to slowing ageing? Has there been a link between disease prevention or...? Right. Um, Okay, there's been a wide number of, large number of studies now looking at the effects of exercise on particularly chronic disease. Mm -hmm. And seeing chronic disease now is one of the major factors in the ageing process. Um, we're now looking at ways in which we can use exercise to mon modify the progress of chronic disease. And we're talking diseases like uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, um, arthritis, even some of the psycho, um, psychosomatic illnesses like depression and you know, anxiety disorders are all now being treated or managed using exercise. Right, okay. So what about, um, I've read some research, I think it was last year, about how weight training can actually reverse the signs of ageing in muscle. Can yep. you sort of discuss that yeah. a bit? Well, it, it can. In fact, there's been some really interesting research uh, in probably the last 15, 20 years where they've actually worked with elderly individuals um, and people in the age of even as high as 90 years of age and they looked at resistance training particularly with the effect on, on bone and muscle and what they've actually found is that uh, even individuals who are over the age of 90 can increase their strength by even as much as 25 to 100 percent. Well, what's the benefit? The benefit is that as, as the muscle gets stronger because it pulls on the bone it actually causes the bone to adapt to that stress and make the bone stronger. And seeing osteoporosis and, and, and fractures later in life are one of the major risks of disability, that's really, really quite important. Okay, so um, what are the... Now, what, what else can we sort of... Oh, just dither a bit here. <sighs> let's talk about... Let's go specifically through... Um, with cardiovascular... With cardio exercise... Yep. How much and when, and okay. to get to get the real benefits. I mean, right. people think that okay, I can go for a bit of a walk each day, and that's enough to. I'm, I'm actually yeah. being healthy yeah. and I'm exercising, but that's not right. really enough, is it? Not really. Look, the, the general guidelines that have just been published by a whole range of very prestigious medical organisations, like the American College of Sports Medicine, say that you need 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise, probably five days per week, to maintain health. So that means that if you want to change your health, you actually need to do even more than that. Yeah. And the guidelines now are recommending that you need up to 60 minutes five times a day to actually change your health status. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So um, can you, are there any shortcuts? I mean, if you look at interval training, for example, mm -hmm. is that a shortcut? I mean, if you do 20 minutes of interval training, that can equate to, say, 40 minutes of walking. Right. So look, we're generally talking in most terms about moderate intensity exercise. So the way in which you could work that out is either using what we call the perceived exertion scale, which the person assesses how hard they're actually working. So on a scale of 10, you might work at a rate of somewhere between 6 and 7 on that what we call perceived exertion scale. And that's, that's, that's the stage at which you're starting to breathe heavily, but you're still able to maintain a talking or conversation what we call talking pace. If you're working above that, then you're work, working probably a little bit too hard, 
uh, and you don't really need to work that hard for most of the fitness benefits we're looking at here. Um, if we start then going towards interval training, that's obviously high intensity work. So that'll be on a scale of on a scale of ten, say to eight to nine, and it involves short bursts of activity. Uh, it might be anything from running 400 metres up to 1,500 metres and do it with a short, short rest interval in between. Do it repeatedly um, for, say, 20 to 30 minutes. You might have a short warm-up beforehand and a cool-down afterwards. But it's very intense. And while it, it does produce benefits in terms of improving fitness, it probably doesn't produce any greater benefits in terms of health outcomes. Okay. So that's really quite important. And the risks are that obviously working at high intensity, you're increasing cardiovascular stress. So you're actually causing a possibility of having a cardiovascular event, something like a heart attack. Um, it does increase the musculoskeletal stress on the limbs that you're exercising. So if you're jogging, there's increased stress going through the hips, ankles and, sh hips, ankles and knees. So that's going to increase your risk of injury. So that's, so that's, there's a couple of things that you probably need to think of. And, Really what you need to do is you need to evaluate each individual on their, on their health status and their musculoskeletal status to see whether they'll be cope with that high intensity training. Yeah, so at the start of any process you need to get ideal to get an assessment with an exercise physiologist. Yeah, look, look that's really the, the best thing to do. And look, even before that you probably should go to your general practitioner and actually seek his advice as to whether or not he believes any, any sort of potential adverse effects of you participating at a moderate. certain age, but I think we're talking 45 plus. I can't yeah. imagine that. Yeah, 45 plus we're talking. Would, would they need to go to, I don't think they need to go to a GP. Um, 45 plus? Yeah. Um, I'm 47. I'm thinking I wouldn't go to a GP. Yeah. Look, I, ask him again, it would require a little bit of, like yeah, it would require a lot of judgment. I mean, if you're... Most GPs would look at you and go, for God's sake, what are you doing here? Well, true, but look, if you obviously have some sort of chronic disease, like yeah. diabetes or any sort of um, cardiovascular problems or respiratory yeah. problems, it's probably yeah. worthwhile to actually seek Absolutely. his advice to actually see whether you should participate. Now this, this audience for this um, these sessions are not sick. Yeah, okay. They're going to be right. well. Okay. They might be pre-diabetic and they don't know. Yeah, Once sure. Once they start testing, they'll be fine. Okay. So, okay, when, when it look at... Um, how, in terms of um, resistance training or weight training, mm -hmm. is it... With the research that was done on looking at ageing muscle and reversing the signs of ageing, that was done with weight training, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. So has there been other research that's looked at, at other resistance um, sizes? <clears throat> well, there's, there has. Um, there's been a, a number of studies looking at use of therabands, which are mainly used in rehabilitation settings, mm. uh, on some of the outcomes in terms of increasing muscle strength and bone strength. Um, Look, they're really not as effective as, as doing some form of uh, resistance training using weights or uh, machines because the resistance you can apply with a TheraBand is relatively relatively small. Right. Um, what about push-ups? On a look, scale of on a scale yeah. of one to ten, when you're looking at doing resistance and weights, doing hard weights would be ten, wouldn't it? Yeah. Where does, hard, where yeah. Does, um, nine to ten. Sure. Nine to ten. So yeah. where does sort of push-ups and those sorts of uh, again, it would depend on. For some people, push-ups might be very difficult. I mean, I've got cl I've got um, clients that I would see who might be over the age of 50 who couldn't do one push-up yeah. or couldn't do one sit-up either, for example. Um, but for many people who are relatively active, um, using a body weight exercise like a pull-up or a push-up or a sit-up can be quite appropriate. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, you just need to work out but what... Are they, they going to get the benefits? That's the question. They are. Yeah. They certainly will. But of course, as the higher number of press-ups and push-ups and steps you can actually do, then you're training for muscular endurance rather than muscular strength. And all the benefits in terms of muscle strength and bone health are to do with high resistance activities.